Middle Age Plosseum, the Emerald Empire. Hermor's off doing some creepy shit in the Middle Ages, and this is what's left over. Decided it was about time to do a national overview, kind of share my thoughts on this nation. I've got a poll up on my Patreon page, where patrons can vote for nations I think I should do a national overview on. And this one's got the most votes. The reason I threw it up there is because I have a vague interest in this nation, mainly surrounding the Thayer communicants. And this unit, let me tell you, is a huge rabbit hole. Like, at first it looks pretty straightforward, but there's all kinds of Rube Goldberg mechanics tied around this unit that I think give this nation an extremely high skill ceiling. Now, Dominion's 5 is a game where pretty much every nation has a high skill ceiling. I mean, you can almost call it a skill sky in this game. How much knowledge and experience you can accumulate. Uh, these things are just, uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into it just yet. But otherwise, this nation actually seems, you know, fairly simple and straightforward. And in a lot of ways it is. You don't have a whole lot of magic diversity. So you're pretty limited in what you can do with your mages. At least the ones that you can just recruit. You don't have any real sacred powerhouse of a unit. I mean, these things kind of suck. You've got really good units otherwise. These Velites, the Ale Legionnaires, the Hastati, Principates, these are all solid units right here. Big old poisonous snake things. Gladiators and Retiari, which are also very good units. But all in all, this nation isn't enormously complicated until you get to the Thayer Communicants. And these are what I think define this nation and separate it from other nations in this game. But I'll still go ahead and go through these commanders and units, kind of give you my thoughts on them. I've been getting some Blitz experience in with this nation, and I've learned a few things. Uh, first and foremost, you know, there's just a normal scout. The assassins are good in that they are cheap, only 60 gold. You can recruit these anywhere. They're not capital only, nothing like that. You could consider using them to help you expand against more challenging provinces. I mean, you're already going to expand fairly well with this nation with the units, but there's a province that just doesn't look like it's worth throwing a bunch of velites into. You may consider a few assassins on it. And I mean, having four to eight of these in the beginning of the game anyway is not going to hurt your expansion. It's just you do have a little bit of competition in your capital recruitment towards the beginning, but these are completely viable to that end. And then later on, you know, because you can recruit them anywhere, you don't need any labs or temples to recruit something like this. Sometimes it's nice to get some of these going to keep your forts busy. It can definitely be nice to have some assassins lying around when you get into a war. Your Centurion, honestly, this is a great leader of units. It's not very expensive at all. It's only 70 gold and it has 80 leadership. It can do formations. This thing is solid and it just comes down to that gold cost. There are a lot of nations out there where you're not going to get 80 leadership for this cheap. Sometimes you're not even going to get 80 leadership at all. So this is a really nice tool to have. The Serpent Lord, however, I mean, it looks 60 leadership. It's a little more expensive. It doesn't even have any more map move. It has less map move than a Centurion. These lizards that this thing's riding, they're slow. It's not sacred. Nothing special like that. It's just a dude riding a giant lizard, which sure, it gives it this poisonous bite attack, which, you know, it's actually kind of cool. But this isn't really useful for anything in my eyes. Maybe throwing into the Slave Collar version of the arena with some gear. This thing wouldn't do too badly in the arena. And I feel a little bit similarly about the Emerald Lord. I mean, at least this thing has 80 leadership, but it's a little more expensive than your Centurion. I think the reason that you would ever get this is if uh, you're just having problems keeping your Centurions alive for some reason. These are tankier units all around. Also, you know, they do look cooler. They do have that going for them. You can talk about efficiency all you want, but at the end of the day, if looking nice is important to you, pick up some Emerald Lords. The Legatus, however, this is actually a solid leader. 120 leadership. It is more expensive, but this high leadership is going to give your units more morale and also lets you line up units in larger formations. Definitely would be pretty important having at least a couple of these in any large death ball, but definitely not an essential commander. Do keep in mind that they do cost two recruitment points to recruit, so they are a special occasion commander. These are recruitment points that you need to be using for your mages, and you're going to want a lot of mages. Now, the Battle Deacon is a really cool commander that isn't useful for that much. Like, he can bless things. He can bless himself. Not sure what you'd want to do with him, but he can do it. Like, maybe if you're doing some weird heavy bless strategy using the Battle Vestals, which I don't think you should do, this guy's going to become a lot more important because you'll be using him to lead expansion parties of Battle Vestals and things like that. But yeah, there really isn't that much of a use for this guy. Maybe for temple building duty toward the beginning of the game. Who knows? I do like the sprite work though. I think it's a really cool looking unit. Purple and gold look good together. And before we get into the mages, I'm going to talk about the Hydra Tamer real quick. I imagine there's a good chance you're not going to be using this. The only thing it really has of relevance to you is Beastmaster. So it can boost the morale of animals, which you do have in the form of Hydras. But unless you're playing this nation very differently from me, which you very well may be, you're not going to be making enormous use of the Hydras, if any use at all. Though I definitely think the Hydra Hatchlings will generally have a place. They are pretty cheap for our commanders though. But yeah, you know, just 10 leadership. Kind of cool that they can swim though. And now we're getting into the juicy commanders and that's as usual, the mages. All three of these have astral, so every single one of your mages can enter 
their communion. They're all sacred. They're all priests. They can all bless themselves. Your Thayergs and your Arkthayergs are both fortune tellers. So they're a little bit safer taking misfortune. And they're also old. So you may want to consider on aging. Now the Thayerg Acolyte here is a very important mage. And that's because it's cheap. 70 gold, researches, jumps right into communions with its priest level as well. And as it's sacred, its upkeep is actually pretty low for a researching mage. This thing is awesome because it's a priest as well as an Astro One mage. And because it's so easy for you to build up communions with these Thayer communicants, you can spam H2 and H3 spells really easily with the Thayer Acolytes, which could potentially be life-saving in the early game. It also makes it really important which kind of magic path is determining the types of spells that you have, the priest spells, because there's a decent chance you're going to be using them quite a bit. And I'll spend a section of this video discussing what paths determine what kinds of spells you have and which ones I think are better, which ones I think are worse. Definitely an important thing to balance out with your bless. Once you get higher up into Thaumaturgy, these things are going to be able to spam out Soul Slay, they're going to be able to spam Enslave Mind. There's no good reason why you shouldn't have a decent assortment of your enemy's units when you are at war as M.A. Pythium. The regular Thayergs are also very important. And that's because they're delivering to you more varied battle magic in your communions. Conjuration is probably something you're going to want to research fairly early on, and I'll explain why later on in this video. And you may want a decent number of Thayergs to spit out air elementals in an early war. Now they're getting a little bit pricier as far as mages go. Like this is three times as much gold as a Thayerg Acolyte. Three times as much upkeep as well. And they've only got about twice the amount of research. And the difference lessens if you take magic scales, and you probably should. So finding the right amount of these to recruit alongside your Acolyte Thayergs is probably something that comes with a lot of experience and the kind of situation you're in. But I imagine in general you're at least going to want one fort recruiting nothing but these Thayergs non-stop for most of the game. You'll definitely want at least a couple doing these Thayerg Acolytes. And as for what you should be recruiting on your capital, that is almost certainly the Arc Thayer. Pretty pricey, but very worth it. And that's slow to recruit, you're going to need to be pumping these pretty much non-stop off of your capital to get any decent number of them. Big reason why you're going to want to keep these moving are the randoms. You can just hit Astral 4 with these. That's crazy. Not a lot of nations in this game that can just recruit an Astral 4 mage. So if you haven't figured it out yet, you're a very powerful Astral nation, and probably one of the most interesting nations when it comes to communions in the game, largely due to this Thayer communicant, which I will get to eventually. But these other randoms are important too. Water 2 is pretty important in climbing the water path. Pretty much can be able to get to whatever you need as far as water goes once you hit water 2. Air 3 is actually pretty high, especially considering the fact that these can just easily walk into any communion. It's going to make casting bigger air spells much less burdensome. And just like literally every nation in the game, being able to cast big air spells is going to help you out a lot on the battlefield. Unlike literally every nation in the game, only some nations can just do that outright. And Epithium is one of those nations. They do have another way to get air 3 that I'll cover in your summons, but this is the one that enters communions. This is also where you get your little splash of fire, something you will want for side searching. The moment you get a fire random one of these, you're going to want to be side searching with it. The fire water cross path is an interesting cross path, especially considering that you're an astral heavy nation. That's the cross path for making rune smashers, which are a magic penetration item. It can help with, you know, things like enslaved mind. And you know, it's very worth mentioning that these things are H3. These things can claim thrones. They can cast divine blessing right out of the box without entering a communion. Really powerful mage right here. Once you're able to afford it, definitely start crapping these out of your capital and don't stop until the game is over. Now I'll go into some of the more intricate strategies with these mages later on in this video. For now, I'm going to talk about the units. This nation, I think, has a very interesting unit lineup. The slinger is one of the least interesting parts about it. This thing sucks. I guess it's okay as siege chaff in certain situations. If you're fighting something that has a lot of really low protection, shieldless, helmetless units, a slinger might become more attractive. You technically could cast flaming arrows with a fire random arc thayer, but I mean in almost every situation you're going to want to be spending this gold on things like Velites and Hastati and stuff over here and not these slingers. Uh, the gladiators and the retiari though however are actually pretty important units and that's because they don't really have any resource cost to them at all. They're not very expensive for what they do. Like the gladiator with the flail, this thing has two attacks and extra accuracy against shielded opponents. This thing is solid and the retiarius has a net as well as a very high damage piercing attack. Now the catch with these units is once they're in a battle where they have either done damage or received damage, effectively at the end of the battle they die. I mean they just walk away but as far as you are concerned they are effectively dead units. So you pretty much only get one battle with each of these units where they play a useful part in that battle. Now where that comes into play is if you need a 
bunch of panic units, say you're getting rushed by something, you need some powerful stuff to make someone think twice about gobbling you up. They're good at guarding mages and other commanders because that's gonna keep them out of the action. And then when they do get into action, you want something effective anyway, protecting that mage. And these are pretty effective units. They're good at eating lance strikes from independent cavalry because there's a good chance they're just going to kill the cavalry. And in general, they're good at bolstering your expansion parties against more difficult independents. A really nice tool for you to have. And the thing is, you wouldn't even really need them and you'd still be able to expand like wildfire just because of units like this. This is your cheapest legionnaire style unit and this is a solid unit. It is perfectly average in almost every stat. It only costs 10 gold, 10 resources, nine recruitment points. It's got two javelins, which is really nice. This is almost like the perfectly average unit. This is like the standard unit of Dominions 5. Mine does have a couple things. The javelins are nice. The skirmisher does not take a morale penalty if you have it in skirmisher sparse line formation. There's actually a pretty nice ability. Skirmish formation can help against arrow fire, which these things could use a little bit of, as they don't have the best protection. Sparse line formation has a couple of nice things as far as attack rear commands goes. One is using your own attack rear commands. This is more likely to get around the enemy lines and get at that rear on the corners. And the other is if your opponent is using attack rear commands, sparse line formations help reach out and nab them and stop them from getting at your back end or at least slow them down on their way to your back end. So this is a pretty nice ability. But in some senses, you know, because their morale is average, it's like you can just take a morale penalty on a Hastati and effectively achieve the same amount of morale. But better to have the ability than to not have it. Uh, where this unit heavily comes into play is in your expansion. I think this is probably the best option you have for expansion. There are some arguments that could be made for a couple other units and I'll go over them, but this is just so easy to mass and it's so effective against most independents that you're going to run into. Now, other things that you're going to be thinking about for expansion are the Legionnaire and the Hastati. What makes the Legionnaire different from the Velite is the Legionnaire costs twice the amount of resources, has twice the protection, which is a big deal, and slightly lower defense, and I think a little bit lower combat speed as well, yeah. It's also losing the skirmisher ability. But what this higher protection means is that this is a hardier unit. It's going to last longer for you as far as relevance in the game goes. It's going to be more effective when you're fighting against other people as opposed to just independence, and this is going to be more effective against independence too. It's just it costs twice as many resources. It's harder to mass. When you're expanding and simply the amount of recruitable units you can muster is more important than the quality of those units, especially because a lot of times when you're fighting independence, these don't effectively have a huge difference between them. And the Velites are generally much better. The reason you'd switch to these is if, say, you took a lot of resources on your build, you think you can afford them, and you'd rather have these units maintain their relevance for a longer period of time. Because once you start running up against player armies, these Velites are going to seem like they've got cardboard armor on, and they kind of do. These Legionnaires are decently chunkier than that. Now, personally, when it comes to building long-term forces, I think the Hastati is a much better pick. Slightly higher in gold cost, just a little bit higher in upkeep. One gold higher. But these things have slightly more morale. They do have that 14 protection. A little bit higher defense skill than the Legionnaires. And the big thing is that they've got short swords. They do more damage more accurately. So this is a solid tried and true unit right here. If you've got the resources to do this, you may consider expanding with them. I still think the Velites probably have the strongest argument there. But after you get you know, your cap circle cleared a little bit, you might start leaning into these Hastati more so, or at least the Legionnaires. I think these are all very good units. The Principe, not quite as much. Now, of course, it is a lot better in its stats. The problem here with this unit is the gold cost. Like, one more gold for Hastati, it's like five. Because, you know, you are getting a better attack, generally some better stats, and it's not that much more expensive. In the Principe, you are getting better stats, of course, but it's a lot more expensive. Upkeep is now getting, you know, this is three gold higher than the Legionnaire. I don't think it's outlandish, like, oh, you're using Principe? How could you do that? They are so expensive. It's not like that. It's just I personally don't really see myself recruiting these in just about any situation. And the same goes for the Triarii. But a big reason here, though, is just their old age. Look at those negative stat penalties. They already have high encumbrance and they're getting some more. But these do have some things going for them. They're high protection. They have formation fighter. Their morale is good. But yeah, the only reason I think I would ever be recruiting Triarii is if I'm doing some kind of weird Roman Legion LARP where you actually want these ranks, as it says in their descriptions. Which would be, you know, it's kind of fun. I've done it before, but yeah, they're just too expensive. They're too slow to mass. And then they're just old and they fall asleep. Uh, the Emerald Guard, due to how ridiculously expensive it is, I think really only has a place as a bodyguard. As you know, this has a really good bodyguard value. This could be really valuable if you're going up against a lot of assassination attempts. It is also a really powerful unit. Like these stats are really freaking good. I'm just not sure if I could find a good situation where I want to mass these for like an army just because of how expensive they are, not only in gold, but in resources and recruitment. 
that's just tough. I see these as mainly bodyguards and mainly in the situation where I'm going up against assassinations. To that end, these are actually incredible. And the standard bear, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. Good thing to throw into just about any large army. Got that standard bonus, makes things less likely to rout. It doesn't have to go in absolutely every single squad that you use. Like, in fact, I don't even think you really need these for expansion parties. Most of the time, they're not going to rout. And if they are going to rout, you're probably going to lose that fight anyway. But I'd probably want a couple of Velites instead, as resources are generally what's capping my recruitment of them at the beginning of the game. But you can also just throw them in anyway. It's whatever. Basically, these things give a morale bonus to whatever squad they're in. So it's good to have one or two in larger squads, especially in your bigger armies, as that little bit of morale might end up making all of the difference at that point. And then we've got the Serpent Cataphract. Now, this is a very expensive unit with high stats, pretty good combat speed for this protection, like compared to an Emerald Guard, which is moving at less than half the speed. And while these lizards are slow compared to a horse, they're fast compared to a dude in full-blown bronze armor. Oh, wait a second, this thing's made of iron. I guess I just paint it. And it does have two attacks. So you'll be netting four attacks a square with these. Got a fatigue damage poison on the lizard. They do have a lance strike with their lance. It's like, yeah, they're tough. Are they 55 gold, 56 resources, 46 recruitment points tough? I don't really think so. In fact, I'm not sure if I've ever recruited these. I just don't really see where they'd come up. I'm not saying it's a dumb idea, like, they're viable. You could have little boxes of these on the flanks of your army doing some attack rear stuff. Could even save your life. But I just don't really want to. You know, you can almost even get a freaking Thayerg Acolyte with that amount of gold. It's just too much gold. And it's more upkeep than the Thayerg Acolyte. Look at this. 28 upkeep a year versus 44. Now, of course, obviously, you know, these have commander recruitment limitations. I just mean as far as, you know, just pure gold costs goes, you can have five Hastati walking around with this for just about the same upkeep, too. In most situations, I'm going to want five Hastati instead of one Serpent Cataphract. But that's just me. If you like the lizards, go for it. Now I'm going to talk about the more unusual units that this nation has access to. One of them is the Battle Vestal. Now, you know, on the surface, these look like really shitty sacreds. And for the purpose of early game expansion, which is what a lot of sacreds are used for, they are. You need to patch up this protection big time to make these things useful. And then on top of that, they still have pretty low hit points. They hit like they're holding a freaking feather. But I am actually going to say that these are good units. And that's because of their high defense skill, their very low gold costs, and their even lower upkeep. This is dirt. This is less than a Velite. So yeah, I do think at some point you should start stacking these up on your capital. It's almost free. Look, four resources. The reason being is eventually you're going to be able to cast a lot of buffs on these. Once the buffs start rolling in, these aren't going to be that much different from a lot of your other units as far as their protection goes. They're also going to hold your bless. And depending on the strategy that you want to take with this nation, you might actually have a pretty nice solid defensive bless. So I actually think that this is a very good sacred. It's just not good for what a lot of other sacreds are. Where these things shine, I think, is that they're just dirt cheap. They hold your bless. They've got a high defense skill. And later on in the game, you know, post alteration seven, that's going to make them really nice units to have around. Now the Hydra Hatchlings are wonky. These things are hard to use because of their poison cloud. There's a very decent chance that you are going to have friendly fire if you are making any use of these because of this poison cloud. These are very deadly units to have lying around. They poison everything around them. They're also pretty obnoxious to deal with when buffed because they do have regeneration and these number of hit points. They're blunt and pierce resistant. They recuperate. They're unsurroundable. These things will field four attacks per square. One of these poison damage hits is actually pretty high. It's going to be patched up in their protection a little bit, padded on the back, kept far away from anything you have that isn't poison resistant, and they're good to go. Now, there is actually a sort of easy, I don't want to call it easy, but it's easy-ish way to get poison resistance, which is, you know, the nature path in this nation, and I'll cover it soon once I've been talking about these units. It's actually really important, not just for, you know, getting poison resistance. If you are using Hydra Hatchlings, it's just getting the nature path is important. Your communion nation, you want nature in your communions. Now, I'll get to that soon. Where these things are useful is a lot of times your opponent might be fielding thugs that aren't prepared to deal with having a few Hydra Hatchlings walking around. They could be a way to get rid of some pesky sacreds that you're being invaded with early on. I've heard of people using these to weaken more difficult to kill independents with their poison cloud using some kind of high finesse retreat strategies. I haven't messed around with that. I've only heard of it. But I do think the main thing that these are good for is countering certain kinds of elites with the fact that even just being around these is going to hurt unless something is very poison resistant. Even this great head attack, if it lands through, is going to get through a decent amount of poison resistance. The reason I don't like to recruit these a lot of times is they're just they're kind of expensive. That's a lot of gold right there. And then they're just really hard to use in your armies because they kill your own stuff. And everything I just said about the Hydra Hatchling is true for the Hydra 
Hydra, the regular Hydra, but just turn up the volume on everything I just said way up. These things have an even crazier poison cloud. They're even more expensive. You actually only recruit one of these at a time off of your capital. But this gold cost at this point is prohibitive for something with eight protection and 12 defense skill. Like unless you super buff this thing out, it's gonna die. It's gonna do a lot of damage probably, you know, 80 hit points with regeneration, that's a lot. But this is a lot of gold in one basket that can't very easily be used with the rest of your armies. And it's also got a built-in counter with this fire susceptibility, something you have to answer before you start swinging them around people who've got matches. Fear's pretty cool though, you have a fear bonus, which isn't that common on recruitable units. Usually it's just something you'll see in commanders. But Oh yeah, very destructive, very expensive, not enormously defensible unit. Doesn't mean you shouldn't use them, it just means they're very difficult to use effectively, and in general, you're probably going to want to be using your gold resources elsewhere anyway. Like, do keep in mind, these are in discipline, so are the Hydra Hatchlings, I forgot to mention. It just makes them all the harder to buff, and anything you're buffing with them is probably going to be in harm's way of their poison cloud, so it's something you've got to factor in. It becomes even more complicated when you consider the fact that stuff you'd be buffing them with, say this Thayer right here, this thing has all the age, there's already something competing for the nature bless with an aging, it's kind of hard to get that poison resistance onto there. And the only real justification for it is making it a little bit easier to buff a unit that you don't even necessarily need. Well, just my thoughts on it, it is really freaking cool. There's nothing wrong with using a unit that's just cool. And now I'm going to talk about what I think is the defining unit of this nation, the Thayer Communicant. This thing is pricey as limited recruitment. You can only recruit one of these per templed fort. By the way, it's not capital only. You can recruit these in any fort with a temple. It holds your bless. And here's the big part, it is a communion slave. It automatically starts the battle entered in a communion as a communion slave. This is a huge rabbit hole right here. A lot of possibilities that this opens up. Now on the surface level, what this is effectively is an inefficient communion slave. It doesn't have any magic paths, so it's gonna have negative fatigue bonuses attached to something like a Thayeric Acolyte casting astral spells. Not priest spells though, and that's something to keep in mind. Those high level priest spells don't cost the Thayeric Acolyte anything in fatigue, and the Thayeric Communicant is going to take one point of fatigue no matter what when a community master casts a spell but that's all it's going to take from one of those spells so that's something to keep in mind but yeah this thing is going to get tired very quickly in communions and a lot of times they're going to die in communions unless you're really careful with them but just like any other communion slave they're going to boost the community master's paths and magic two of them will boost by one four will boost by two eight will boost by three sixteen will boost by four and so on and at first you know that seems like okay that's that's a neat little gimmick and then when you start thinking about like the implications of this it starts getting more interesting if you start recruiting these from turn one and I think you should by turn four you're gonna have enough of these to put your third communicants into an h3 damage spell spamming communion that's kind of nasty right at the beginning of the game and then once you start getting piles of these you start getting more forts built up and you got these kind of scattered around all over the place this is effectively making all of your mages which can all enter communions stronger wherever they are whenever you need them to be just by towing around some third communicants now where this really becomes what I call a rabbit hole is when you start considering the fact that these are communion slaves, which means whenever a communion master casts a buff on itself, these things collect that buff. You know, anything from body ethereal to fire shield, elemental resistances, personal regeneration, temper flesh, iron skin, anything these things pick it up because they're communion slaves they're not going to rout and there's a good chance they're going to be asleep anyway they're sacred they hold your bless these are some of the most defensive units in the game when you stack up 20 plus buffs from these from your communion masters these things are going to be a pain in the ass to kill. If you've got a wall of these that are all like hyper buffed from your communion masters and just ignoring whatever the heck is being slapped in their face, behind them you have a bunch of astro mages casting things like enslaved mind, like really nasty spells. Suddenly what you can do with these is becoming very interesting. And this is what I mean by like the skill ceiling is really high. I don't even know the full extent of what you can do with these and the fact that they take every single buff that your communion casters cast on them and so easily. I've done some messing around with it. I'm gonna have a demonstration later on in the video. I've got this this huge long line of these in a sparse line formation holding off this big army it's so funny but I don't know the full extent of the possibilities with this unit which is yeah, that's why I used the word it before and I'll use it again that's why I call it a rabbit hole absolutely awesome unit and I think learning how to effectively use these gives this nation a lot of depth which it doesn't seem like it really has in the first place due to its low magic paths not varied amount of mages things like that it doesn't seem like that complex of a nation but this unit right here gives this nation a ton of depth and I think someone who's very knowledgeable and experienced with using this unit 
It can be very scary. Something else I'm gonna quickly mention before I leave this page is you get a lot of Astro Pearls a turn with this nation. Because of your summons, you're going to need a lot of Astro Pearls. And I'm just about to spend a decent amount of time talking about that. It's really nice to have this guaranteed Astral Income right here. I'm gonna do some site searching right away to find some more because you're gonna need all these Astro Pearls. Now what I've got here are your national spells. I'm just gonna talk about them real quickly. These are all summons. And I have the ones sorted out that I think are the most important. A lot of these like Pride of Lions, I think is kind of a waste of nature gem. Awakened Hamadryad is almost impossible to cast anyway. Doesn't climb nature. It's, I think, also a big waste of nature gems. With Heavenly Choir's Path Requirements and Conjuration 9 Requirement, there's a good chance you'll never even cast it. And Heavenly Wrath is just kind of expensive for a commander that is not a mage. And that leaves us with these three summons right here. I think you should probably be summoning all of these at some point in the game. By far, the most important one is the Lar. This thing comes in right at Conjuration 5 and only costs a nature 1 mage to cast this spell. Only 16 nature gems for this. This is a really nice mage that has two nature and earth. Two things that you don't have. Now you also don't natively have nature one. However, that's the easiest path to find on an independent mage. It's very easy to find. In fact, I'll say you are unlucky if you don't find this on one of your independent provinces. You're very unlucky. So as long as you find one independent nature mage, and when you do, you should definitely build a fort there and get your lab on it, your temple, if you need, you're probably going to want a temple there anyway, for various Thayerg stuff. Pop up a couple nature mages, do some nature sight searching, get enough nature gems for Lar, and you are now into nature and earth. And the nature water cross path is a nice little bonus here. This thing's also just a really nice mage. It's ethereal, recuperates, it's stealthy, has a pretty hefty supply bonus. But the real big thing is that big nature and that earth, because these are really important paths to you. And these are both things that you want in your communions. Now here's the problem. This doesn't have any astral. This doesn't have any blood. It can't enter communions without a crystal matrix. And you can't build a crystal matrix because you don't have the earth astral cross path. Something you are very likely to want to do with this nation is empower a lar in astral. That's expensive. That's going to cost you 50 astral pearls, but you only got to do it once and then it can make crystal gear. It can make crystal matrices that you can put on other lars. You can put them on your nature mages that cast the thing in the first place. You can put them on any mage and now that mage can enter a communion. Now there are strategies where you may not even consider this, you know, taking a dormant rainbow, for example, which by the way is perfectly viable on this nation probably wouldn't even think about empowering a lar but if you've got an imprisoned pretender and if you are needing other things in your communions before that pretender wakes up and can start fixing some of your problems with its paths that's where you think about empowering a lar but this mage really is a godsend for this nation comes in at conjuration 5 which is you know it's a useful research path anyway much more accessible than conjuration 6 which is where a lot of useful summons come in and then it just fixes so many problems that you have with your magic diversity it can even help you start climbing into other paths some magic. For example, if you get really lucky with your nature sites, end up with a decent amount of nature gems, build a thistle mace, and at conjuration six, you can summon up a troll shaman. That's going to have a path in death. So that's one way you can wiggle into death. Super important mage, really nice thing to have. Something you should definitely be cognizant of as it may save your life. A harbinger is also a very good mage. This thing you can actually use as a thug. And at 25 astral pearls, for you, that's just five turns of astral pearls off of your capital, guaranteed. And you can cast it with an astral random Arc Thayer. This is very accessible. Only Conjuration 6. Three air magic right out of the box. This can cast really big air spells. You can already cast these pretty easily with your communions. Where this thing is nice is yeah, it's a viable thug. It also flies pretty far. So this is big air magic where you need it, when you need it. But where I'm mostly thinking about this thing is yeah, you don't really have much in the way of thugs in this nation. Well, this is it right here. If you need raiders, this is a pretty good one. Uh, the Archangel, however, I'm thinking more in terms of climbing fire. This thing comes in at Conjuration seven costs 50 astral pearls you need a five astral mage to cast it which is just an astral random arc thayer wearing a starshine skull cap and then you suddenly have four fire that is freaking awesome that is huge fire now this isn't as big of a deal because you actually can get decent fire into your communions and cast whatever fire spells you need that way. But it is big fire on a big pair of wings. It shows up wherever you need it. It can summon more fire mages pretty easily with fire gems instead of astral pearls. The, what's it called here? The flame spirit right here is an F3 mage that requires F3 and 30 fire gems to summon. A really solid summon that you have available to you. Added bonus is that it's H3 on a big pair of wings, which might be relevant when you're capping thrones. So you aren't at any kind of shortage of H3 priests with this nation. And now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking 
talking about your banishment and your smite spells because these are pretty important on this nation, a little more important than they are in other nations due to your Thayerg communicants, allowing your Thayerg acolytes to spam these almost from the very beginning of the game. A lot of times I think these are secondary, even tertiary to whatever bless that you're getting a hold of. But on this nation, I think you should carefully consider which one of these you're picking up. What determines which pair of spells you're going to get is you're just going to get the generic banishment and smite if all of your paths are tied. But if you have a magic path that's higher than the rest of them, you're going to get specialized spells tied to that path of magic. And if you have two spells that are tied for being the highest path, it's going to be whichever one is furthest to the left as they appear on the pretender creation screen. So if I wanted death, for example, not earth, I'd have to make death higher than earth or bring down the earth path lower than death and then I'd have death. And because I think these spells are so important with Pythium, I'm going to go through and kind of talk about which ones I think are better to prioritize than others, which honestly I think this is generically important information. I think it's just a good thing to know for about any nation, but just especially important with Pythium. These spells I think are more or less balanced against each other. They could be dramatically different at times too, but for the most part there's a balance here. There are some that I definitely think are better though. The ones that stand out to me are what you get if Earth is your highest path. Your banishment spell is on the low end of area of effect and the low end of range, but it's on the higher end of damage and it does Earth grip. So it actually grabs undead that it hits, screws up their defense, and ties them up, slowing them down in their advance. And the smite spell you get is actually really good. Some of the others are going to do more damage overall or have better range, like the range isn't very good on this thing, but it petrifies if it can break through the magic resistance. Now petrification is potentially a kill spell. They're going to have to pass another MR check after the petrified after a certain number of turns, which by the way during that time they're frozen solid. If they do pass the check they can start moving again. If they don't, they die. They are effectively turned to stone. They're a statue. So this is I think a very good option. You could do worse than taking air. The banishment spell has a really big area of effect, does a decent amount of damage, and has better range than most other banishment spells. And the smite spell has a lot better range than most of the other smite spells. And it also does some shock damage, which means it can stun. And astral I think is also a very good option. You've got a pretty good range on the banishment spell with a nice area of effect. This one will stun undead. And then your smite spell has maximum range. It can hit anywhere on the battlefield. It does its damage and then it paralyzes. And these three are my personal favorites when it comes to this nation. These are the three that I think are most worthy of consideration. That's earth, air and astral. That doesn't mean that these other ones aren't viable. I just think these are better. I mean death for example has a kill spell with its smite. It also does fatigue damage. It has a really powerful smite but the range is really poor. Nature is just kind of wonky all around. In some ways it's the worst. In others it's the best. Its banishment for example has a horrible area of effect but it's a kill spell. So what that means is that this is not very good against chaff undead which is most likely what you're going to run into. What it's very good against is if someone's using undead dead thugs or SCs. Suddenly this is terrifying. And the smite is kind of goofy. I actually really like the smite on the nature. Got decent range, doesn't do a lot of initial damage, but it entangles and it causes bleeding. And bleeding in its own sense is just about a kill spell. So Word of Thorns is actually pretty powerful. Uh, Blood also has a pretty powerful smite and then it does a lot of initial damage and then it causes wounds. But I definitely think that you should consider earth, air, and astral above the rest of these personally because they all have good banishments and excellent smites. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about your bless here. I think a bless is mostly oriented toward your mages and your Thayer communicants and that I don't think you should be gearing any of your bless points toward the battle vestal. So to that end I'm thinking more of a mage centered bless and maybe something a little more defensive if you're going to be doing anything funny with your Thayer communicants defensively. You want some resistances and stuff like that. Which means if you're going to have elemental pass on your pretend you're probably just going to want resistances. There's not really anything else competing. I'm not saying you should necessarily go out of your way to get these elemental pass. It's just if you're going with a rainbow already, if it's what you want to do just for the path diversity reasons and all the cross paths and things like that, construction, rituals, whatnot, the bless is just a nice thing that comes along with it. Uh, with earth, of course, taking some reinvigoration is a really nice option as you are a communion heavy nation. There is always fire and shock resistance though, but I think in general reinvigoration is going to be your strong pick. And astral is, it's a little bit competitive because magic resistance is nice from a defensive standpoint. Spirit sight is just something that's nice to have on mages, but our 
Arcane Finesse, I think, is a very strong pick. Gives you a little bit of penetration, which could make all of the difference in a battle. Now, when I'm weighing Farcaster and Arcane Finesse against each other, generally what I do is I think, all right, am I playing an Elemental Magic Heavy Nation or am I playing a Sorcery Magic Heavy Nation? With Elemental Magic Nations, I generally lean toward Farcaster, and with Sorcery, I generally lean toward Arcane Finesse, just because a lot of Elemental Magic relies on range, and a lot of Sorcery relies on magic penetration. Now, this isn't completely consistent with every single spell and all these magic schools. It's just what I generally think is true. And especially with Astral Magic, and this is like, I think, the definitive Astral Nation, Arcane Finesse is really nice, because a lot of really powerful Astral spells require on breaking through your opponent's MR. Death, which is fairly usual with most nations, is one of the least interesting blesses. You could take Undying just to make your Communions just a little bit hardier for one battle, or to make your Thayer Communicants a little bit harder to kill outright. Uh, undead Command is another option, but you're probably not going to be summoning a whole lot of Undead. It's just, it's there. Something you might as well tack on if you want. You could swing up into Stygian Flesh territory, give your Sacred Units 10 in vulnerability, which, you know, would be helpful on your Battle Vestals and your Thayer Communicants whenever your pretender eventually wakes up and if you have an imprisoned pretender by the time that comes around you know it's like you're probably already going to have ways to get them nice amounts of protection i, I hope you would a uh, spirit sight of course is really nice and requires some death in your bless and it also pushes up astral if you want that super far range smite though earth is also a good path for smite and banishment but yeah death is not all around that exciting uh, unaging is something that i think is pretty strong with this nation or you're gonna have a whole bunch of mess to deal with concerning your arc theers and your Thergs and such being old ass men, but it isn't necessary if you want poison resistance, that's fine. And with blood, it's just you should probably just take strong today just to make your mages and your communicants more hardy. It's like, what are you gonna do with strength? What are you gonna do with blood surge or blood bond? What are you thinking here? I, I think I think Strong Vitae is definitely the way to go. Also, just having one point of HP is going to push your Thayer Communicants up into a new regeneration bracket, which means the moment you get personal regeneration into your Communions, these are going to be regenerating at 2 HP a turn. Your Arc Thayers actually have a really low amount of HP outright, so getting that 3 HP from a Blood Bless is going to knock them up into an 11 HP regeneration bracket. It's also going to make them a lot hardier. I think 8 HP might be enough to get one shot by Seeking Arrow. Yes, it is. 8 armor negating magic damage. <laughs> oh, yeah, again some HP is a pretty strong consideration and it's generally nice to have blood on your pretender anyway or else you're going to have some trouble getting hold of it. This one's got 9 HP having a couple will be nice for that and the Thayer Acolyte has 10. Oh wait a second a part of the lower HP might be the old age here so getting an aging will help with this a little bit I think. I don't know when this is calculated out but yeah definitely not a bad idea at all. Now I'm talking about that rabbit hole thing you know it might even be worthwhile. Now, I'm not saying you should do this I'm saying you can to put regeneration into your blood along with some of this HP to get up into that regeneration bracket and then along with stuffing personal regeneration into your communion and then these Thayer communicants suddenly become even harder to kill you get like soul vortex up onto them oh, it's just nasty but this is all speculation this ain't nothing I messed with like I'll just straight up say this is like some meme stuff right here but it would be pretty funny to see this kind of thing in action a 25 shock resistance the unkillable communion slaves as for pretender design I think you can really Really comfortably take anything from like a dormant rainbow to an imprisoned rainbow to scales on this nation. I think it's a very flexible nation in that regard. Like to be honest, you could probably even take an awake expander if you wanted one. I, you don't really need one, but I do think that this is a flexible nation. So I encourage you to play toward your style. I'll go over a few things that I think are better picks. Uh, the monument, statue of fertility, and statue of order are all I think decent picks for an immobile chassis, where you do some combination of earth and astral and nature in your bless, maybe just some unaging and reinvigoration, maybe just some arcane finesse and reinvigoration, you know, just something like that. You could do worse than the Demi Lich, which could get you some pretty decent cross pass for fairly cheap as well as pretty high into death. So it's a cheap option for a rainbow-ish pretender that if you're going for a death heavy build is a strong consideration. It also does have a helmet slot, which is nice. This nation does have access to the Divine Emperor, which is a really nice pretender your chassis it only costs 90 points but it starts with two dominion so it very well may be your cheapest option for a rainbow pretender depending on how you're building it, it also has some interesting slots you know it's missing its weapon and shield slots it doesn't have boots but it's got four miscellaneous slots kind of neat now, if you're setting this out to a rainbow pretender you could probably build a copper arm anyway and give it arm slots if you need them you've got access to the frost father which is a pretty efficiently costed rainbow chassis depending on how you're setting it up uh, the gray one is a trinity so you end up with three of these with split cross 
paths. I cover this one in detail in my Marignon video, so check it out if you want to see me talk about this. I think this is an excellent option for a Rainbow Pretender chassis. Probably what I would personally go with if I was building Rainbow on this nation. Though do keep in mind that you do not get the Astro Earth Cross Path with the Grey One chassis. Uh, the Serpent King is nice if you're doing like a really high nature build of some sort. Just be careful with that because I think the Nature Smite and Banishment is a little bit narrow in use compared to the others if you are planning on using that strategy in this nation. And of course there's a Great Enchantress if you're going for a very astral heavy build. You also get more astral pearls. And there's some other cool chassis here and there. You know, Virtue is just sweet. 25 in vulnerability, 5 awe, uh, Combat Caster, stupid expensive. A Great Archon is new, it's fresh. Decent Research Inspiration bonus, Powerful Alchemist, some really cool paths for being a super competent. So I'd want some death on this bad boy. Get that Soul Vortex in there. Wow, I can only wear crowns. Here's an example of what I think is a decent dormant rainbow build. You have three powerful mages coming in around the end of year one with your growth and magic scales intact. You can get by on a lowish amount of recruitment on this nation and you don't need resources. You definitely benefit from this stuff, but it's not stuff that you need. These Velites are very efficient and I think this is definitely a comfortable build for a dormant rainbow. And if you really wanted that Astro Earth Cross Path, you don't have to go with the gray one. I just think having three times the amount of mage turns on your pretender is really nice. If I was to go on prison with this, I'd probably boost some of the nature and the death and the astral, maybe grab a little more blood. This is all just for magic diversity purposes over here, being able to cast better rituals more easily. And that higher astral is just to make sure I still have a good smite and banishment online. Though the death one isn't bad. I just much rather have that range 100 astral smite. And for a scales heavy build, I might look at something along the lines of this. I think order is one of the lesser important scales, just because I, at least with the way I recruit, I'm not very likely to get capped on order. Though there is stuff in here where you might want order for. I think the resources are more important. And I mostly just stick to like Hestati and Legionnaires and stuff like that where it's never going to be a problem for me. But luck is a very good scale if you can afford it. You can risk going to misfortune a little bit easier with this nation due to your fortune telling abilities. But that doesn't mean that you should discount luck. Paired with magic, it's a great income scale, both gem and gold. And also really good for infrastructure, you know, free labs, free mages, things like that can break you another pass of magic. An awesome scale to have. So I'm going to talk about what I think are some research priorities with this nation. I think some of the schools you're going to want to focus earlier on with your research are Conjuration, Thaumaturgy, Evocation, and to some extent Alteration and Enchantment. And I'll talk about some of these spells that have led me to this conclusion. Storm Power is something that you might find yourself using at some point. If you've got a Storm Up, which is something you unlock at Evocation 5, an Air Mage that casts this will get a bonus of plus one Air Magic. If you happen to be using Air Mages as Communion Slaves, this is going to make your Air Communions more efficient as well, because they're going to get that path boost as well. Phoenix Power at Conjuration 3 is similar, except for fire. A fire mage casting this will get a magic bonus of one. What this also grants is 15 fire resistance, which is a lot. And this is going to go to your communion slaves. So if you're fighting someone who's employing fire, this spell is extremely handy. A lot better than other personal buffs for fire resistance. You're also getting some an earth power. This gives an earth mage an earth magic bonus. Say you're using Lars and communions, which you should if you're able to, as they can get some important spells into your communions. And also there's just nice things that you can cast with earth magic, nice buffs and stuff. This also gets a lot of reinvigoration into your communions. This cleans off fatigue, which is really important in extending the lifespan of your communions. It also helps with protecting the lives of your communion slaves because if you pick up enough fatigue, they start taking damage and they die. Power of the Spheres is a pretty important path boosting spell as well. It gives a plus one bonus to all magic paths. Once again, anything that targets yourself, it's going to target your communion slaves. I'm going to be talking a lot about things that target communion slaves while I'm going through these spells because I think that's an important part of this nation. Now, a lot of this path boosting stuff is not going to affect your communicants because they don't have any magic paths, but they're not the only things that you can use as communion slaves. There might be situations where you want to use something else, though, for the most part, your communicants are going to cover a lot of your communion slave needs with this. They're disposable to some degree, but this also gives a plus one bonus to magic paths that your mage has. Say, for example, you want to get a higher path in air on an air random arc thayer, but you can't either easily cast storm or you can't cast storm at all, so you don't have the research for it. You're looking to cast Fog Warriors or something, but you haven't researched enough evocation to get Storm and some Storm Power, things like that, but you want to get your air path up so you can cast something like that. That's where Power of the Spheres comes in. All you need is Astral to cast this, and it'll boost your air magic as well. A Fire Random Arc Thayer could cast this to get Fire 2, then cast Phoenix Power and get Fire 3. And suddenly, they're comfortably throwing up Fire Elementals and stuff. Very useful spell. At Conjuration 4, you've got Light of the Northern Star. This is going to give an Astral Magic bonus to the entire battlefield, including your opponent's Astral Mages, something to keep in mind. But if you're doing some more soul slay and enslaved mind centered 
stuff with your Astro Mages, that's where this becomes a very powerful spell. Strength of Gaia, if you are managing to get a Lar into a Communion, this is something that a Lar could cast reasonably easily. This will boost nature magic and put regeneration into your Communion, along with Bark Skin and more Strength. The Strength isn't really relevant, but that's 10 protection, a little bit of fire weakness, something to keep in mind. But it is neat that this is a way to get regeneration into your Communions, if say you don't have any enchantment research. Uh, Conjuration 5 is the big one. Depending on your strategy, I think this is an important goal early on, and Lars are a big part of that. This is where you get contact Lar, and you should have been able to find some kind of nature mage somewhere by now. If not, that is so unfortunate. This is something that I will say you can rely on for the most part, is finding an independent nature mage. If this were the late ages, it'd be a little bit iffy, but in the middle ages, you're still finding them plenty consistently. Even in the late ages, you find them all over the place. But most kinds of tribe will have nature mages. Lizard provinces will have nature mages. There's Woodhenge Druids lying around. Hobergs often have nature mages. Very, very common. And then you've broken into passive magic, very important passive magic that you didn't have before, so that you can cast things like Howl, which brings a bunch of wolves onto the battlefield and harasses your opponent from all sides. What's also really nice, and why I think it can be okay to sidestep, say, Thaumaturgy research or Evocation research, something that gives you some offensive power with your Astral spells, is for one thing, you do have H3 Smites to kind of help you along a bit when it comes to offensive casting. And then once you get up here, you've got air elementals. These are really powerful. You've also technically got access to fire elementals as well as water elementals. You have a lot of variety here. These cost gems to summon in battle, but they're all powerful units. And you've got access to enough of a variety of them, but it's definitely easiest to get air elementals going and they will solve a lot of problems. If someone comes in rolling in size and shock resistance, you know, you've also got fire elementals. You can shake things up. It's definitely a pretty important research goal, I think, earlier on in the game. Uh, Conjuration 6 is also really important for the Harbingers. This is your Air 3 Angel, and probably the easiest access you have to a proper Thug chassis. You know, these only cost 25 Astral Pearls. This would be really expensive for some nations, but you are guaranteed 5 Astral Pearls a turn. Easy. That doesn't mean you should just throw all your Astral Pearls into a hole, like, you know, I'm suggesting empowering Alar here for a lot of strategies, and that's expensive. But this is very affordable for this nation, just because how many Astral Pearls you get and you're probably going to get more once you start doing sight searching. There's also specters here which is something to consider if you take death on your pretender. You might want to get around to casting some of this if you can work out some death gems just to get some death mages going. Specters are pretty good death mages with good cross paths. Troll King's Court is a good way to get a hold of an earth mage if you can if you really need one. This will land you an earth three mage. Sea King's Court will land you a water three mage. So you can wiggle up here anyway. Flame Spirit will get you a fire three mage. Forest Troll Tribe is actually something I think is a little bit more important important for you, and that's because Lars can cast this without too much trouble, and this could be a way for you to break into death if you don't have another way, so you didn't take it on your pretender. A forest troll tribe is guaranteed death magic, and if you took sufficient nature and death magic, Lamia Queens are one of my favorite mage summons in the game. 25 nature gems for a powerful nature death mage with really good abilities that also can random blood. There's a way to get into blood magic. And of course, up in Conjuration 7, you get the small elemental spam that summons big piles of smaller elementals, and because this increases, in number of effects with the level of the casters and the fact that you can make these big, fat, freaky communions and easily get like an air seven mage in a communion, suddenly the spell becomes really efficient and you're making a ton of little air elementals. And I say one air seven mage, I mean, you could have like five or six air seven mages on the battlefield. Like, that's freaky. That's what those communicants enable for you. You can actually even have a lot more than that. Ugh. Freaky to think about. And Angelic Host, uh, don't confuse this with Heavenly Wrath. You probably don't want to cast this one. Angelic Host is the one you want. This is the one that gets you the Fire 4 Mage. It's also an H3 Priest. It also has these angels. I forgot to talk about them. They're, they're kind of nice units. They've got vulnerability. They're powerful. You don't get very many, but they're nice units for what they are. So just a little bonus on here. What you're casting this for is the F4 Mage though. Uh, Mound Fiend is a Death 3 Mage. So this is a way to guarantee a decently powerful Death Mage if you already have one. And if you can wiggle up into Nature 4, which you should be able to if you empower a Lar by first building a Thistle Mace and then building a Mood Vine Bracelet because, you know, it'll have astral and three nature at that point. This is a nature three mage, which you could then pass off that thistle mace and moon bracelet to and build a tree lord staff. I'm in nature pretty high at that point. But the main thing you'd want an ivy king for is if you think about going into vine ogres, which are up here at conjuration four, and these are just really powerful summons. Lots of HP. Uh, Alteration has a whole lot of buffs in it, and these are all things that you're going to want to be thinking about if you're planning on doing any kind of defensive shenanigans and big walls of unkillable communicants. You're going to want to be stuffing them full of as 
many buffs as possible. You just have Twist Fate being cast at pretty much every interval of a turn. You know, Air Shield makes it really hard to kill them with projectiles. Personal Luck, 75% chance of escaping a killing blow. Poison Resistance, right here, 15 Poison Resistance, only at Alteration 1. Mirror Image is kind of like Glamour. You know, cold Resistance, there's so much stuff you're getting here. Stone Skin is a natural protection of 15, and Large is actually a pretty big deal. This is going to make your Commune Slaves bigger, which is going to increase their HP, which is pretty important, especially once you get regeneration online. Mist Form reduces damage they do take to 1, unless they get a really big hit at some point, or some kind of magical attack. Iron Skin Natural Prot 20. Moss Body's kind of funny. Lars can cast this. Reduce damage for a bit once they do take damage. There's a Poison Damage Cloud. Pretty big one too. Make sure you have Poison Resistance online when this goes up. Liquid Body, I think, is pretty important. Helps keep Afflictions off. Slash Blunt and Pierce Resistance. Temper Flesh, another way to get Slash Blunt and Pierce Resistance. And some FR. Body Ethereal's a big one. This will make your communicants really hard to hit with mundane weapons. Stygian Skin is an alternative to Stone Skin, though magic weapons will still pass through it. Elemental Fortitude is a way to protect your bases a little bit when it comes to protecting from elemental damage. You need a Nature Mage to cast this. Something that's nice about this one is there's some problems when it comes to mages buffing elemental resistances onto themselves. Sometimes they don't want to, even when it would benefit them. I think they're much more likely to cast this one because, say, if they don't want to cast like a fire resistance spell, but they're fine with casting a cold resistance spell, they'll just cast this anyway and you'll get that FR. A swarm is just a useful spell that if you are breaking into nature anyway and you should try to, this just spams a whole bunch of bugs onto the battlefield and they're annoying and they fatigue your opponents out. At Alteration 5, you do have access to Solar Eclipse. You might consider casting this if you took like, say, a Spirit Sight Bless and you think it's going to hurt your opponent more than it's going to hurt you. It's going to affect the stats of everything on the battlefield that doesn't have some form of dark vision. Uh, Bone Melter is just a cool spell that if you do manage to get Lars into Communions, it's an Area of Effect 1 kill spell. Invulnerability is a good deal if you can break death into your Communions. This gives you 25 invulnerability. That's effectively 25 protection against mundane damage. Slap this onto a big wall of communicants up front on turn one and watch your opponent cry. That's some other big pile of nasty buffs. Like at Alteration 6, Soul Vortex. This is a big one and a big reason to break into death if you're doing any weird communicant shenanigans. This restores both fatigue and health at the expense of surrounding units, which is funnily enough going to significantly increase the lifespan of your communions if you have your communicants out front all soul vortex. Now you want to be careful if you're passing your own units through there because they'll pass through the soul vortex and take damage. Well, that's a really good thing for your opponent's units to run into. You can almost think of it as some kind of absorption battery for power for casting more spells. It's, it's a horrible thing. And I think actually this is one of the most powerful spells for this nation if you are using that strategy. This is a huge deal right here and a very good reason to prioritize getting into death. And of course getting that death magic into communions is why I think specters are such a good thing to get into summoning. It's because that's how you get the death astral cross path fairly easily. And alteration seven is of course an important goal for any nation with air magic or earth magic or nature magic. That's where you're getting fog warriors is going to give your entire army mist form. Marble warriors is going to throw stone skin around very efficiently on a huge area of effect and mass protection can give your entire army bark skin. They're all really nice spells. A uh, phoenix pyre, bit of a can of worms here. So there's almost certainly a way to use this with your communicants. You have a fire mage that's a communion master cast this. This spell is going to affect all of your communion slaves and when they die they're going to blow up in a huge ball of fire and pop up somewhere else on the battlefield. This has implications. This is part of why I call communicants a rabbit hole. Phoenix pyre is so deep in that rabbit hole that I don't even want to touch it. You tell me how to make use of Phoenix Pyre with communicants. That is some whack ass shit right there. Possibly really powerful. Possibly some clown shit. By all means, you tell me. I don't even want to think about this. This is just where I, this is where I'm drawing the line with these things. I do not want to go deeper in this hole. Evocation isn't something I want to go too deep into because effectively you have access to just about all of this stuff. Presuming that you get Lars into communions, which I definitely think you should by empowering one and then using it to make crystal matrices or just making crystal matrices for them with say your pretender or a lucky random on some kind of wacky mage you get. This is all stuff that's available to you other than maybe some death magic stuff and some weird cross path stuff. Uh, evocation 3, you get arcane probing. Now I'm the kind of person I usually prefer to go around and look for sites manually with my mages. I'm just set in my ways but I recognize arcane probing is a very efficient way to find astral sites and you are going to want a lot of astral pearls. You will use them. So definitely think about spamming the shit out of this on every single province you have. It's almost certainly going to pay for the astral pearls that you spend casting it. Uh, magic duel is something that could be really relevant to you 
if you notice that your opponent's pretender has a little bit of astral on it, or even a lot of astral on it. Up to six astral, your level one Thayerg Acolytes can magic duel with that thing, and those are fairly disposable. You get rid of your opponent's pretender if you notice it has six or less astral on it by magic dueling it with a big pile of astral one mages. One of them is going to win that fight eventually. Or if your opponent just has some other big powerful astral mage that you want to get rid of, here you go. Make sure it's not mindless though, so don't try to use it against a golem or something. A Stellar Cascades is a fairly useful spell. If you're having trouble killing something through conventional means, put it to sleep and then try killing it. This does a lot of fatigue damage and a pretty good area of effect, and you can spam the shit out of this. Only Astral 2. And Mind Hunt. This is a very important spell right here. You can natively recruit Astral 4 mages, so you have a lot of Mind Hunt potential. And your Astral 3 mages, you know, you can get Skull Caps onto them, Crystal Coins if you get lucky, you can get Astral 2, Earth 2 mage, or just put it on your tender, you know. Suddenly, you can start zapping enemy commanders from really far away. Now, you're going to have to have some Thaumaturgy research to properly use this. Level 2 Thaumaturgy will get you Mind Burn when you use Mind Hunt. Level 5 Thaumaturgy will get you Soul Slay, and that's the big one that kills stuff. Though Mind Burn kills a lot of things, too. Just don't cast this if your opponent is putting Astral Mages around wherever you're targeting. It's really good against thugs, as you know exactly where that thug is, and this Mind Hunt is magic phase, so it's going to hit them. Someone was even saying in the comments in one of my recent videos that this will actually hit a mage that is stealthing out into another province, something that I did not know, because sure, they stealth before the magic phase hits and mind hunt comes in, but this will still hit a stealthy commander, and this comes in before the movement part of that commander's turn, presuming, you know, what he said is true. I, I haven't actually tested it, but it makes sense to me, so this is a way to deal with someone who is avoiding magic phase interception by stealthing out their thugs. I'm not going to go too in-depth into construction with this particular video. You're not a thug nation. You will, of course, want some basic boosting stuff and some magic penetration gear is nice too. Eye of the Void, Spell Focus, Rune Smasher, things like that. And of course, Crystal Matrices that come in at Construction 4 are pretty important for getting other passive magic into your communions. Or sometimes, you know, you just want one of your mages to start being in the communion at turn 1 so they don't have to cast Communion Master. That could be really important sometimes. Uh, Enchantment also has a good deal of buffs. Lots of elemental protections. These ones are actually fairly strong compared to the alteration ones. Magic resistance is a good deal. Boost that MR. This is a way to get a lot of poison resistance. If you're thinking about screwing around with your hydras, uh, yeah, this is where you want to be looking. <laughs> and flight. Now you might be thinking, well, why would you cast flight on your communicants? They're not going to fly anywhere. Well, if your opponent's thinking about casting earthquake, ain't going to do shit to them if they can fly. <laughs> Flying shield makes them about twice as hard to kill by just about anything. Though that cross path is a little bit finicky to get here. Yeah, I can't even think about how you get a hold of this off the top of my head other than just using your pretender. This is a weird one. Now, personal regeneration is pretty important to get into your communions. This is going to extend their longevity. Fire shield is really cool. This is going to actually weaponize your communicants by actually causing them to do armor-piercing fire damage to whoever's attacking them. Astral shield is also really nice as it's going to paralyze people that are attacking them. Oh, I forgot breath of winter. It's going to get cold auras for your communicants. By the way, with like things like this and uh, soul vortex, you might want to use sparse line formations if you're doing weird stuff like this. Uh, remember, you do have fire in communions natively. You could cast flaming arrows. If it comes up, you know, you have a lot of archers or a bunch of slingers. Your javelins will be on fire if you want them to be. Just something to keep in mind. Anti-magic is pretty nice. I believe this gives four magic resistance, so not an insignificant amount to absolutely everything that you have. Uh, Cloud Jubbies is pretty important if you're going to be making use of Harbinger Thugs. Like, they can fly around pretty decently, but this will get them even further. And I'll also bring them in at the magic phase so they can intercept stuff. Poison Ward is something Lars can cast fairly easily. Decent area of effect is going to give poison resistance to your units. Can help them survive if you've got a bunch of Hydras running around. If you do manage to get poison resistance onto your entire army, that's where Foul Vapors becomes attractive, and Lars can cast this pretty easily. Now, because you are such a powerful Astral Nation and Astral Pearls come easily to you, you could consider casting Eyes of God. That is a pretty powerful spell diplomatically. You can also put a target on you, or blind whoever casts it if someone casts that goofy fire spell that's specifically made to counter this one. Uh, don't cast Solar Brilliance, you'll blind everything you own. Though this might actually be a decent bomb spell, I haven't really tested it in that regard. You know, to just have one powerful Astro Mage roll in with some protection and just 
blind an entire huge ass army. And Thaumaturgy, this is a pretty big school for you because of how powerful of an astral nation you are. You're gonna need Thaumaturgy 1 right away. Get this before you get anything else because you need your acolytes to be able to enter communions. And that's how you're gonna do it with communion masters. Blink, oh yeah, that's right, I gotta test that. Mind burn is something your astral mages can spam toward the beginning. It may or may not be better to cast your smite depending on the situation. So do weigh this against your H3 damage spell versus whatever opponent you're up against. A sailor's death, funnily enough, depending on whatever the hell is going on might actually be on the table for you as this does a decent amount of damage in an area of effect one it's gonna affect multiple targets you're pretty devastating against size one units like little goblins or something like that so keep this one on the table a thaumaturgy 5 is a really big one if not just for soul slay as this at range 100 precision 100 is going to one shot stuff so long as you can get through their MR and you know presuming they're not mindless so this is definitely where you want to move away from using your H3 smites for sure and start soul slaying those clowns that are invading you. Gateway is actually a pretty cool, so this is something you could easily cast. You have Astro Four Mages. You could be moving your armies from lab to lab. It is a very good way to move your slower units around, say from your capital. Get them much closer to the front lines where we need them to be. Dom Dirty 6, you get Enslave Mind. It is better than Soul Slay in that instead of just killing whatever you're targeting, you gain control of it. Also, it doesn't affect mindless beings. A lot of times when you are fighting mindless beings, they are un dead and you've oh, got plenty of good ways to deal with undead with your banishment. Banishment is super easy for you with this nation because how easy it is for you to get priests into communions. And I am going to mention something I usually don't mention when I'm talking about national overview and that is a level 9 research goal. This one is actually I think pretty important for you. It's like you know once you get your alteration 7 and your conjuration 6 and your construction 6 and all those research goals out of the way you should start leaning right up into thaumaturgy 9. Go straight for this because you are going to get a couple couple of spells that are very powerful. One of them is Astral Travel. If you have a powerful Astral Commander, you may need to get some leadership equipment to make this useful. You can bring him and all the units he has under his command to a distant province, which could be a bunch of Thayer communicants that are getting ready to boost him in a communion so he can cast Master and Slave. And this is going to do an enslaved mind attempt on every single unit your opponent has. And you, don't, you, don't, you don't even need to cast Astral Traveler. This, this is just something you can cast really easily with this nation because of how powerful of Astral Mages you have and how easy it is for you to build communions. You can spam this shit. It's just, I'm mentioning this funny gimmick of the concept of Astral Traveling, some powerful Astral Mages with a bunch of communicants, and casting Master and Slave a couple times. Oh, this looks like it takes some math with that fatigue cost and casting time. This looks, like, this looks like hard work pulling this off. I think I'll try it by the end of this video. But yeah, lean right into Thaumaturgy 9 and start master enslaving people. That'll piss them off. Now I'm doing this expansion demonstration with a dormant rainbow. So this is only going to be easier if you say have a scales build. I don't think there's anything wrong with prophetizing your initial commander. You might be thinking about prophetizing an Arc Thayerg or an H4, but it's like you can have an Arc Thayerg be an H4 just by throwing a couple communicants in with him in a battle. And it's like, what else do you want a H4 priest for? I do think you should be recruiting a Thayerg communicant every single turn as they have a limited recruitment and they are extremely useful. What's a little more subjective are your commanders. I personally do like to pick up about four to six assassins at the beginning, but every turn you spend recruiting assassins or centurions, that's one less smite cannon that you're going to have. If you end up getting invaded really early on, it'd be really nice to have more Thayer Acolytes. And Velotes are definitely my preferred unit when it comes to expansion. When you are resource capped, you can get twice as many Velotes as you can Legionnaires or Histadi. <laughs> Look at that. Blood Pythium. This would be really freaky. This is a multiplayer game having this right here. No nature mages in the cap circle though. This is the first time I've seen that in some time. I've ran quite a few test games with Pythium and I've noted that every single time there have been at least two nature mages in the cap circle. I'm sure I'll find some pretty quickly though. Expansion army with Pythium is pretty easy. Any kind of legionary unit really. Just put them all in a big long line. Stick them at the front. Have them on fire closest. This will get them to throw their javelins. I'm going to have this prophet sitting here just smiting. Word of power doesn't have any maximum range so it can smite no problem from turn one. This is the astral smite. And what's really important with Pythium right away is to get some resources onto your capital. With some nations, you don't want to immediately clean out your cap circle. You want to leave room for future expansion parties to move through. But Pythium is one where you really need those resources and getting those resources is going to make your expansion better. So clean out your cap circle as soon as possible, or at least most of it. Here's that first expansion army against about 40 standard independents. They match up pretty well against these at their big old shields. 
care very little about arrows. Lost three Velotes. You are going to lose Velotes as you expand around. Oh, that's a weird one right there. Uh, make sure you get Thaumaturgy 1 researched right away. Oh, with these randoms, I'm probably just going to grab Evocation 3 real quick for Arcane Probing, and then focus on Conjuration for magic diversity purposes. These assassins haven't been doing too well against the Horse Tribe Chiefs. Usually they do just fine. I've turned this one into a hero. Oh, a big fatty. Well, this is the risk you take with assassins. They're not always going to work out. Oh. This one actually managed to win that fight though. Here's that expansion army against those fish dudes. I'm up against some poison here, so a little bit iffy. Shamblers hit pretty hard too. Wow, I don't think any of my guys got poisoned. Nice. I lost a decent number though, that hurts. Nice, got another horse tribe chief. Might work out after all. Relying on Dentatus. Pretty painful battle here against the Onyx Sorceresses. Griffin causing a bit of trouble. Lucky there aren't more Griffins here, honestly. Uh, these are some pretty tough units right here. Did a lot of damage to my Velites. Lost a third of my second expansion army right away. Youch. Here's my initial expansion army against a little smattering wolf tribe. Match up pretty well in general against a tribe like this due to the lack of shields, the lack of helmets. These units really don't care about archers that much. And now I have access to nature mages. It really is that reliable. Like sure I didn't have any of my capstar this time, but look, nature mage, nature mage, nature mage, nature mage. They are all over the place. Nice, you found a weightless scale mail there. Here they are up against Lion Tribe. A little bit harder than some of the other tribes because they at least have shields. But as you can see, these javelins still did a decent amount of damage. These archers are nothing though. Zero prot. Lost a few Velites. Always hurts. <laughs> this just barely worked. The assassination expansion against the Horse Tribe Cavalry. Lost three assassins here. They usually do a little bit better against the Horse Tribe Commanders, but you can't always rely on your assassins, especially against cavalry. They usually have decent defense skill. That initial starting army still going strong. Here they are against some um, Wolf Tribe. A decent number actually. Only like 20 of these left, they're having no trouble taking on over 40 wolf tribe. Here's some Velites up against Barbarians. There's also a little bit of overkill for this amount of Barbarians. But overkill is better than under. And here they are against a province with some heavy cavalry. These things are actually pretty scary. Uh, larger numbers will absolutely clean through your Velites. You see this? See how hard it was for the Velite to get through just that small amount? So be careful with heavy cavalry. That's where your assassins want to head to if you are using assassins. Oh man, this is gonna be a mess. I knew it was gonna be. That's why I brought along a couple of their communicants to do some smite spamming. Help out with this little expand. I even have some wolf tribe in here. Oh man. Oh, this is gonna be way worse than I thought it was gonna be. Five Bloodhenge Druids. What the hell? And a Chimera. Yuck. Let's see what the hell is happening here. Oh, are you kidding? <laughs> Kill it! No! Oh my gosh. Alright. At least it flew away from my back line. Chimeras are not a joke. These guys back here spamming agony, of all things. At least some of my communicants survive, so you can still spam Word of Power. Oh man, I did not deserve to win this battle. This is disgusting. Look at that, Thayer Acolyte down, my commander and my Centurion down. Oof, what a disgusting fight. And I don't even get Bloodhenge Druids, I get Woodhenge Druids from here. But yeah, I actually didn't notice, it's uh, turn 13, usually I see what I've got by turn 12, but I could subtract here. So I'm looking at 21 provinces at turn 12, I have 23 now. Little bit oblong, you know, you're probably gonna run into someone down here maybe over here but it does go to show you the power of expansion that this nation has even just using the velites i've already got a castle here palisades going up here palisades going up here i get a palisades going up here which i was intending to do got a palisades going up here tons of gold in the bank i could be using for better mages for infrastructure mercenaries are definitely on the table with this nation depending on how your expansion goes it's only going to make it better oh, another palisades going up jesus tons of these provinces net me the nature mages i need it really is not not that hard to find nature mages. This is something you can rely on, finding a nature independent. Even the province I just got, the Woodhenge Druids. Uh, I do like the wolf tribe when it comes to nature mages because they also have a 10% chance of randoming death. Now with magic three skills, you could spam these out. The nature one mages aren't useless. You can sight search with them and you might get that 10% death random. It is considerable. I'm not sure if I'd do it, especially because I have a dormant rainbow waking up any moment now, but I do prefer the wolf tribe to say like a Woodhenge Druid, which is more expensive and you don't get that 
that chance at that 10% random. I also prefer them to say a lion tribe witch doctor because though you actually have a 10% random to get quite a few things and a couple of these are useful like an earth random wouldn't be bad same with the nature too but you're getting these with a lar anyway the whole point of this is getting a lar so the earth and the nature aren't as important it's much harder to get that death random with one of these only 2.5% chance but yeah pretty solid expansion and this is even with me kind of screwing up with my assassins a little bit and I also forgot to recruit Velites for a turn so it could have been even better than this where your bigger concern is with this nation is potentially getting rushed by someone with some really freaky ass sacreds if you have to try to fight them off with your smite cannons and hope it works depending on what you're fighting it might not work that well might be a little tricky against someone who's fielding units with really high MR but that's the risk that you take you shouldn't take any shit from a nation like Ermor because you can spam really powerful banishment highly boosted banishment another thing to know is you don't really need to spread out your fortresses with this nation you don't have any kind of capital only unit that's high on resources so it's not going to hurt you just surrounding your capital forts you could build a fort on every province with this nation if you wanted to which if you get temples up could land you communicants wherever you need them or if you're doing some really goofy stuff with communicants you can just get a whole bunch of them going i don't know what like i said that's a big old rabbit hole right there do a little bit of demonstration as to why that is now here in a second all right so check this out i've got a big old line of communicants here in a sparse line this might be able to be done better i'm not sure i've barely messed around with this concept i've also got some in the back corners to help defend against attack rear commands and i'm fighting a decently sized decently scripted marignon army right here this thing's gonna crap out some fire elementals it's shooting fireballs it's spamming smites and i've got some mages here here are the lars by the way and they're Pretty beautiful. Look at them. Just look at them. All of these are going to be communion masters. And I'm going to try to cast just about every single buff in the book and see what happens. This is initial volley. Does nothing. I don't care because they're all what? Invulnerability 25, lucky, mist form, pierce resistant, and bless and shit. Jesus Christ. This is only going to get crazier as the buffs stack on too. A couple of fireballs and flaming arrows. I missed a lot of the northern star up. The knights are coming in. Look. Not doing anything. These their communicants. Uh, not so sure about these fire elementals though. Yeah, 15 fire resistance. Oof. We could definitely do better, I think. Yeah, they're taking some damage from these fire elementals. Needs some work. Like, look at this. These guys are holding off the entire army. Along these guys, <laughs> all freaking paralyzed from astral shield. These guys are back here, casting all kinds of nasty stuff. Ray's dead is coming through and messing up these guys while they're paralyzed. Enslaved mine is going off quite a bit. This is wild right here. I did lose some, so this definitely needs some work. But Marion's units are not getting through your open. I'd say that just as a fire element rolls on it. But yeah, it gets messed up pretty quickly. Look at this. These guys are holding back a bunch of fire elementals into the little fire resistance on these guys. Maybe taking a big old Mimi fire and shock resistance plus the full elemental resistances wouldn't be too bad on a bless. It'd be hilarious. I think these are all my units over here. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a cast it on them and stuff. That's hilarious. Look at all of these stolen Marignon units. So yeah, this obviously needs a bit of work here. Lost 11 Thayer communicants. Still really crazy though. Gained 32 crossbowmen, three Knights of the Chalice, and a Man at Arms. Didn't lose any of my mages. This is a hilarious aspect of this nation that I think could definitely be really strong in the right hands with the right amount of knowledge and experience above what I possess. I think this could be really powerful. And the rabbit hole just got deeper. I remembered something when I saw Blink in the list of spells, and that's that... If you have a communion caster cast blank, check this out. Pop! It blinks all of your communion slaves. Look at this! Oh my gosh! This could be ridiculous with like soul vortex phoenix pyre type stuff. I don't even know what to think about this. Look, they're even having. Look at this. This guy's just ignoring this huge ass group of knights back here. He doesn't care. What? What's going on over here? Oh my gosh, this is so funny. Uh, they got through him. But yeah, this is just this is just way too big of a rabbit hole. I don't even want to think about the possibilities that come up when you're blinking these guys all over the battlefield. What a mess. 
Look at this, I gained a witch hunter. He's intact too, mentally. I, it's because I got him with charm. I had these Lars and Bob here spamming charm instead of enslaved mind. <laughs> I'm just picking up commanders as I move around. Look at this, I was moving back to my capital here. Some free knights, they raided this province before. And now I'm setting up this guy right here to do the big no-no. I've got some penetration gear on him, a rune smasher, an eye of the void. This is just to get him the arcane finesse bless right from the very beginning. It was a crystal matrix to make sure he's in a communion right away. And I don't know if this is all the best way to do this. I'm just experimenting right here. And I'm thinking maybe time stop. I want to see if I can get away with a couple of master and slave casting. <laughs> oh man, what is this going to be like? Could do time stop again. Yeah, I'm going to try out this script right here and see what happens. All right, he's got 40 communicants with him. Let's uh, astral travel him onto this. <laughs> Scary looking Maring Yon army. See what happens. Oh boy. All right, so he's preparing to cast Time Stop. There it is. So what Time Stop does is it slows time down to about 10% of normal speed for five rounds for everyone except for this Arc Thayer right here. So he should be able to take the time to get a cast of Master and Slave on. There it is. And now I can already see there's a bit of a mess starting right here. There's people turned around, slapping each other. Oh man, spell casting was interrupted. Let's see, will he get another one off? There it is, second master and slave. Oh man. Now let's see what the results of two master and slave looks like. I have most of Marignon's stuff now. All right, so check this out. I came in with one Arc Thayerg and 40 Thayerg communicants in the magic phase, by the way. So this can actually intercept a moving army. Didn't lose the Thayerg or any communicants. Gained 55 crossbowmen, a feeble-minded high inquisitor. You need to be gift of reason to get him back, Dom, and why you would. 10 knights of the chalice, 59 men at arms, seven pikeneers, and a witch hunter. And these things turned around and killed almost all of the rest of Marignon's stuff, including the province defense. What a ridiculous fight. So yeah, that's something. Look at all that. Astral travel, master and slave, some combination of time stop, though I obviously don't have that polished out yet. These communicants are a very powerful feature of this nation, as I think I've properly demonstrated. Like, you could have more than one Arc Thayerg doing this easily. This is not that much gear. And Astro 4 Thayergs are not that hard to get. You know, Astro 5 just with the Starshine Skull Camp here. I'm sure this can be worked on to be even more efficient as well. Like, you'll see he didn't get that second casting of Time Stop online. I'm not sure why that is. Maybe the first one was still online and it won't cast it after. Oh, I thought it could, though. A new one will replace an ongoing one. Hmm. I do wonder why I didn't cast it a second time. It's not a spell I have a whole lot of experience with, so. But he got the two master and slaves off anyway. There might be a way to get him to do three. That's just a quick little demonstration of the concept. Decimated Marignon's army and got 133 units without taking any losses whatsoever. I did spend 30 astral pearls doing this though. So this is expensive in pearls, but you get a lot of pearls as this nation. Also, this concept could probably be combined with hyper buffing Thayer communicants. And that's just what I mean by the skill ceiling with this nation. Is so ridiculously high because of this unit. I don't even know the full extent of the possibilities with this thing. And I can't really do these units justice in a little video like this, you know, without spending a really long time going deep into this nation. Well, I hope I've at least demonstrated these concepts well enough in this short amount of time. 